Hi, welcome to video number 12. Today we're going to be talking about covalent bonding. As you may or may not recall, uh, when atoms uh, react, they react in such a way that they want to achieve a more stable configuration. Uh, and normally that means that they want to fill their valence shell um, to eight valence electrons. There are a couple of exceptions, uh, hydrogen and helium being the notable ones uh, in which uh, they only take two electrons in their valence shell because their valence shell is the first energy level that can only hold two electrons. Um, we normally don't tend to talk too much about helium because it's a noble gas and it doesn't react, so the main exception that we're going to be looking at will be uh, hydrogen. But in any case, atoms react in such a way as to become isoelectronic to the, noble, to the closest noble gas. Uh, there's two ways that you can achieve this. Ionic bonding, which we've spoken about before, and covalent bonding. Uh, as a quick reminder, ionic bonding is uh, the bonding that occurs when atoms transfer uh, valence electrons from one to another in order to form ions, which are charged species of opposite charge that will attract, will have an electrostatic interaction. And uh, that bonding normally occurs between a metal and a non-metal. Right, and we can see that um, illustrated quite nicely here on uh, this image. Um, on the other hand, covalent bonding occurs is the bond that occurs because of sharing of valence electrons between two or more atoms in order to fulfill the valence shell of each one of the atoms that are making the compound. Uh, it's very common in um, nonmetals and semi-metals. And it does not form any charged species. It does not form ions. It forms what we call molecules instead. All right. So if you look here, for example, we can see that here we have a hydrogen with one electron, and right next to it is another hydrogen with one electron. If the two of them get together and share those electrons, each hydrogen can call the two electrons their own. All right. And so each one of the hydrogens would have two electrons, which would mean a filled valence shell for hydrogen. And so that makes it uh, nice and um, straightforward. Similarly, here we can see that the sharing of two electrons in chlorine will give the chlorine on the right eight electrons, the chlorine on the left eight electrons. Each one satisfies the valence shell having eight electrons being filled, and that makes it more stable. And this is one of the reasons why chlorine in nature exists as a diatomic molecule because it's much more stable in that form. All right. Um, so the important thing here is that when you share, every atom can call itself, um, it can call its electrons themselves. All right. So they can count them as if they, they weren't being shared. All right. And that's the important thing. Um, why does the bond form? Well, the bond forms um, when you have the attraction between the shared electrons, all right, and the nuclei of each one of those atoms that are sharing the electrons. So in the particular case here, we have a molecule of hydrogen, H2. We can see that those electrons are being attracted by the, both of the nuclei. And that attraction keeps the, nucleus, the nuclei from repelling each other and makes that relatively strong covalent bond. Covalent bonds are quite a strong interaction, okay? And that's what holds the molecule together. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Um, depending on the number of uh, valence electrons that an atom needs, it will form one, two, three, or even four bonds. In the, ca in the case of nitrogen, for example, which has five valence electrons, being in group five, it needs three more valence electrons. Well, how can it do that? If it bonds with three individual hydrogens, each hydrogen will need just one more electron. By sharing with three hydrogens, we form, you know, three covalent bonds to make a molecule of ammonia. Now, you can see here there are eight electrons now around the nitrogen atom and two electrons around each one of the hydrogens. So each of the atoms is satisfied um, by doing this. Similarly, we have a molecule here of methane, and the molecule of methane, we can see that there are eight electrons around the carbon atom, satisfying the carbon. Carbon brings only four atoms to the game, so it needs to react with four 
different hydrogens in order to have eight electrons in its valence shell. Now, an atom does not have to necessarily bond to four different atoms to make four bonds or to two different atoms to make two bonds. It can make single, double, or triple bonds depending on the number of electrons that it's um, sharing. So, for example, we can see here we have two oxygen atoms. Each one's bringing six valence electrons. If we bring them together and now each one of the oxygen atoms bond shares two electrons with the other ones, we can see here that we have eight electrons around this oxygen and eight electrons around the oxygen on the left side. So each oxygen by sharing has obtained a full valence shell. Similarly, we can see the case here between two nitrogens sharing three electrons with the other one. It makes a triple bond. There are three shared pairs of electrons and each nitrogen now has eight electrons around um, their nuclei and that's going to make a very strong bond. Single bonds are going to be normally weaker than double bonds which are always going to be weaker than triple bonds. So the number of electrons that are being shared um, is going to make bond, the bond stronger. All right. So um, and remember each bond is done by the sharing of two electrons whether they come from individual atoms or um, they don't. So here we have another set of examples of molecules just very quickly we can see the molecule of hydrogen is a single bond because we're sharing two electrons. A molecule of fluorine similar to the one of chlorine will be, have a single bond because again each chlorine is bringing one um, uh, electron to be shared in the bond. Now we can have some interesting molecules. We can have carbon bonding with two molecules of oxygen. Each molecule of oxygen you can see bring atom of oxygen um, brings six electrons. The carbon bringing those four orange electrons is sharing. And so we can see that if we go around the carbon, the carbon by sharing two electrons with each one of the oxygens can have a total of eight valence electrons. Meanwhile, by sharing two oxygen electrons with uh, the two carbon electrons that it's getting, each one of the oxygens independently has eight valence electrons around that. And that's how we get a molecule of carbon dioxide. Or we can have a carbon sharing one electron with four independent fluorine molecules and make four single bonds all right, and that way the carbon has eight and each fluorine has eight around it in a carbon, uh, in a molecule, for example, of carbon tetrafluoride in this particular case. Okay, so let's go ahead and just add one level, one extra level of um, difficulty to this. Sometimes uh, a molecule or an atom will share electrons without anything getting anything back but they're still sharing going on that will be called a dative covalent bond it's a bond that is formed when one of the um, atoms involved in the in the bond puts the two electrons in the bond while the other atom is just accepting here we can see that this oxygen here with the blue electrons all right is doing a normal double bond with this atom here on the left side. There is one bond, there's four bonds being shared, two coming from blue, from the oxygen in the center, and two coming from red, the oxygen on the left side. If we look to the bond down here, here we have a single bond, and how do we know there is a single bond? Because only two electrons are being shared. One pair of electrons determines whether the bond is single, two pairs of electrons, double, three pairs of electrons, triple. So we have a single pair of electrons being shared, so it's a single bond, but those electrons are all coming from the blue or the central oxygen. See that all of the six electrons that this lower oxygen, this oxygen on the right hand side, are not involved in the bond, but this allows each one 
of the oxygen atoms to have eight valence electrons around it. So we have one, two, and three oxygens that have eight valence electrons around this nice and happily. You can also have that between atoms that are not of the same type. Notice that here sulfur has its electrons represented by dots. We have six electrons uh, from sulfur. We know that sulfur has six electrons because it's in group six. And to the left side is sharing double bonds with an oxygen atom. And we can see that there are only six original oxygen electrons on the right side. But by sharing two electrons with the sulfur, this, sulf this oxygen now has eight. The sulfur itself now has eight by making the bond to the oxygen on the right side. So it doesn't necessarily need to bond to the oxygen on the left side. But because there was enough oxygen there and the oxygen wants to achieve a full valence shell, the sulfur having what is called a lower electronegativity, having a lower resistance to share electrons, will share a pair of electrons directly with the oxygen on the left side and now allow that oxygen to also have its eight valence electrons. So the key thing about dative covalent bonding is that this atom that is sharing, all right, the two electrons is always going to have a little bit of a lower electronegativity. So again, the concept of electronegativity is the idea of having a lower or, or having resistance to sharing valence electrons. So if you have a lower resistance to share electrons, it means that you're more willing to share the electrons and therefore you can do that. So you can see here that sulfur has a lower electronegativity than oxygen, all right? And so it is more is willing to share those electrons with oxygen. Don't worry too much about that at this point. We will see more about and talk more about that both in the, in the lecture itself and as we continue with this idea of covalent uh, bonding. So at home, I want you to try, uh, attempt these four molecules, all right? Try to do these four molecules. We have a molecule of selenium oxide. We have a molecule of phosphorus trifluoride. We have a molecule of uh, iodine tribromide and a molecule of sulfur trioxide. Um, for some reason, the computer has decided to change this back up when I put them down, but um, such is life. All right, I will correct that. Uh, in the lecture, but just make sure that you try those molecules out. So the final thing that I want to talk about today is just what are the properties of covalent compounds. And first of all, because um, covalent compounds make molecules, they're not making bonds or uh, making ionic, um, they're not making charged species. So the only interactions that one molecule one discrete molecule has with the molecule next to it is what are called weak electrostatic uh, forces that occur because of uneven distribution of electrons, all right? And those are called intermolecular forces. Those are always very weak and easy to break, all right? Which uh, means that they will have low melting points and low boiling points because it requires less energy to break those weak interactions than it would be to break strong ionic bonds, which we saw occur in uh, ionic compounds. All right. Um, the one thing that um, we can see is that depending on how uneven that on its distribution of electrons is going to be, those intermolecular forces will be stronger or weaker. And this is something that we'll discuss in the next video. But at this point, uh, I just want you to understand that in general the intermolecular forces are going to be weak and therefore have lower melting and lower boiling points. All right. And finally, because uh, there is no um, ions that are being formed, all right, covalent compounds do not have electrical conductivity either in the solid phase or in the liquid phase. All right. So even if we try to pass some electricity through them, they will not conduct and therefore uh, the light bulb will remain uh, off, all right, because there are no charged species to um, conduct electricity. Uh, solubility, 
conductivity in aqueous solutions uh, and whether they're going to be crystalline or not will depend more on the way that um, on the on the polarity of the compound um, it will depend on whether the compound is an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte these are ideas that we are going to be covering in the further uh, videos so keep this in mind and I'll see you next week bye bye